You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. When we talk about whaling, we're talking about significantly more targeted attacks than standard fishing or even more targeted than spear fishing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and the criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, Kev Breen from Immersive Labs is going to talk to us about addressing whaling attacks. All right, Joe, before we dig into our stories this week, I had uh, an interesting conversation with uh, actually one of my coworkers who was uh, talking about password managers and his elderly parents. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I are both big fans of password managers. In fact, it's hard to imagine life without them at this point. (laughs) But my colleague was pointing out that particularly for the elderly, password managers can be troubling or hard to use. As easy to use as they are, they're not bulletproof. Correct. I would imagine that's true. You know, sometimes you go to a website and things don't automatically get filled in the way that you would think they would. Some sites sort of try to thwart the automatic filling in of information, particularly banking sites try to do that. A terrible idea. Yeah. Well, you can see why they do it. They don't want some malware automatically filling in credentials or something. But you'd think they would also coordinate with at least the big-name password managers. Right, right. Uh, The other thing is there can be confusion with your password manager of what your password manager is doing versus what your browser is trying to do itself. Right. The password manager in in a lot of these cases is a browser plugin. Yeah. You're looking at the same application, and even me, a technical expert, Dave, uh, <laughs> so, sometimes I don't know what's doing what, right? Right. Uh, why is that happening? I right. Is that the browser? Is that the plugin? I don't know. I could absolutely see where the confusion comes from. Sure. Yeah. And, and the point is that I, I think for a lot of people, it, and, you know, I see lots of people poo pooing this, but I think for a lot of people, a little notebook with their passwords written down in it, you know, put in a safe place in their home. Might be the best solution. That is way better than just reusing the same password over and over again. Right. As long as those passwords are good passwords and you're keeping that notebook secure, you're right. You're probably not going to have a problem with that unless yeah. somebody breaks into your house. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> right, exactly. But the thing is, most of these cyber criminals aren't going to break into your house. No. They may even never know where you live. No. <laughs> uh, which is why it's it's okay to do this. I've seen people poo-pooing this as well. It's not the best security practice, but it's certainly better than reusing the same password over and over again. Yeah, yeah. It could be very effective. Yep. And uh, unless, you know, you, yes, there aren't roving bands of, of bad guys breaking into people's homes to steal their notebooks full of passwords. Yes. It's highly unlikely. <laughs> so Agreed. a good point from um, my colleague that, you know, sometimes you just got to, you have to be realistic, right? right? You have to understand your risk model, your personal risk model. Think about it. Am I really worried about people breaking into my house? I'm not I'm not anybody important. We like to say this a lot, that people should always be aware of the fact that they are targets of value to these malicious actors. Right. But there is a scale along which you fall on that. Yeah. Uh, and you should protect yourself accordingly. Yeah. And, and not everybody can handle, you know, some of these technical things, things that we take for granted, those of us who have more time (laughs) under our belts with all this technical stuff, uh, it can just be uh, beguiling for people who who aren't used to it. A a notebook would not be a good use case for me for one reason, because I looked at my password manager yesterday uh, and there's over 400 entries into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That would be very difficult for me to maintain with a notebook. Right. But yeah, you can see that frustration with a password manager could mm-hmm. be something that would that would lead to someone just reusing passwords. Absolutely. But don't do that. Write them down in the notebook before you do that. That's, <laughs> right. That's right. a profoundly bad idea. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to some stories this week. Uh, I'll kick things off. Uh, I have a story from the folks at Pradeo, a security company. They did some research. They found a smishing Trojan that is impersonating the Chrome app. This is uh, from their blog. Really? Um, Yeah, so what's happening is folks will get an SMS message on their mobile device Mm -hmm. and it'll ask them to pay a custom fee to release a package delivery. And there's a link there 
And when they open the link, the first thing they're asked to do is to update their Chrome app. Hmm. Yeah. And of course, the update is malware. Right. Then they're asked to pay a small amount, just a couple of bucks, to pay the, the fee to release the package delivery. This, of course, is also fraudulent. Basically, it's the cyber criminals getting their credit card details. Right. And making sure the credit card works. Yep. Yep. That's why the small charge. And once uh, they install this fake Chrome app, it starts sending out SMS messages from the victim's device. More than 2,000 messages per week. Really? Yeah. To other people? To other people. Presumably from your contacts to infect them as well. Well, this says it's to random phone numbers. Random phone numbers? That seem to be sequential. Yeah. Yeah, and it does it for a couple hours a day, and this is how they propagate the attack. You're infected, and you start spreading the infection. Yeah, definitely like a like a worm almost. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the folks here at uh, Pradeo talk about uh, the ways that they're trying to bypass security detection. First off, they're using the victim's phone number to do the SMS phishing. So right. it, it's coming from a legitimate phone number. Correct. Right? They use obfuscation techniques, uh, and they call on external code to hide the malicious behaviors, which can help defeat threat detection systems. Mm-hmm. They have put out a bunch of variations of the app. So basically when an antivirus starts to catch on that this is a bad thing, they change it just enough that the antiviruses won't detect it anymore. The right. engines won't detect it anymore. So uh, they go on you know, to say the best practices are mostly just the type of stuff we talk about to prevent social engineering. You don't provide your credit card details if it's an unknown sender, go right to the package delivery company with the tracking number rather than clicking through on a link. Right. Right. Uh, and also, you should only download apps from the official app stores. Agreed. Google Play and, and Apple Store on, on iOS. Update them from there. Don't update them from someone who says, update need- from me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You can trust me. Yeah. Yeah. No, no you can't trust them. No, you cannot. So, uh, yeah, interesting one. One to uh, look out for. All right, Joe, what do you have for us this week? Dave, my story comes from HelpNet Security. It was written by Daria Alexandrova, uh, who is a senior incident response analyst with Mm. Siren. And her article is titled, Exploiting Common URL Redirection Methods to Create Effective Phishing Attacks. Hmm. And I thought this article was interesting. That's why I brought it in here to talk to the listeners about it. But, you know, when we think about phishing campaigns and all their components, sometimes we think about URL redirection, but we really don't think about URL redirection as top of mind. Mm. So this is definitely something we should consider as part of the whole when we're looking at phishing. We definitely always want to consider the way the phishing message is structured, seeing who the phishing message came from, those kind of things. But okay. once the user is enticed into opening something, either clicking on a link or, or opening a file that's attached, there's other things that happen as well. There's still an opportunity to stop What's going on? And Daria talks about why attackers use these URL redirections, and she talks about the three E's, that it's easy, elusive, and evasive. Hmm. I would add another E that's effective, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there there are three methods that the article talks about, and the first one I think is very interesting. It is an HTML attachment with JavaScript that delays redirection to a phishing site, Hmm. right? So you get an email, Mm -hmm. and there's a... An, an HTML attachment on it. It says, pay the invoice or, or open this file or something. And you open that file up and it displays something to you that could be anything, really. It's an HTML file. So anything you can do in HTML, you can show in this file. Right. But there's also a piece of JavaScript on this page that's included with it. Yeah. That has a timer. And when that timer runs out, it redirects you to a phishing site. Now, if you're looking at the browser and you're looking at the URL, and the URL is just a link to a file on your computer, your guard is down, right? I'm not connecting to anything. But then the browser refreshes, and you're you're out at a phishing site, and you don't check the URL again, Uh. right? You still think you're on that file, or you you think something has happened. What it does is it changes the timing of looking at that URL if you even do it. Hmm. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. The next thing she talks about is Adobe Open Redirects. This is a service that's offered by Adobe, Hmm. right? It's a redirection service, and basically you get an Adobe URL, and it points you to anywhere you want to go. Okay. It's it's kind of like the uh, other services we're going to talk about in a minute. The example she talks about is an Adobe attachment that says, your password expires today. 
either reset your password or, and I thought this was very clever, click here to maintain your current password. Hmm. Right? And if you click on that link that says, click here to maintain your current password, it takes you to a phishing site that asks you to enter your username and password. Uh, right? Uh-huh. I thought this was almost almost insidious in the way it's done, right? <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to just keep their current password? Right. You know, th that is what 80 to 90% of the users want to do. Yeah. If they see an easy way out, they're mm -hmm. going to take that. Right. I just want to get back to doing whatever I was doing. Exactly. Yeah. That doesn't have to do with URL redirection, but I thought that the phishing hook there of, hey, I got an easier way for you to handle this mm -hmm. is, I think that's really clever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bad guys are really good at doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Normally, we tell people hover over the link, right? Right. And and see where it goes. Well, if you do that, it's going to go to an Adobe domain. Mm -hmm. And then when you click on it, bang, you go to the Adobe domain, but that just redirects you to the phishing site. Mm -hmm. And anyone can use this service, which is the third point that Daria talks about in this article is the link shortening services, things like Bitly. These mm -hmm. are companies that use redirection as a business model. I never would have imagined you could have used something as simple as redirection <laughs> as a business model, but there are entire companies out there built on this. Volume, volume, volume. <laughs> right. Exactly. right. These links can point to anything in the world. Yeah. I, I use Bitly personally all the time. It's a great service. It shortens your link down to just a couple of characters beyond the actual Bitly, mm -hmm. bit.ly. It's very effective. But, of course, any of these links can also be malicious. Right. Now, you know, services like Bitly have the capability where if you're suspicious, you can go to the Bitly website and put in the shortened link and it will show you what— It will what, show you where it goes, right. It will show you where it goes without taking you there first. Yes, yeah, so I think you can just put a plus sign at the end of a Bitly link and that shows you all the information about that link. I see, I see. So, yeah, it's a good way, you know, if you're suspicious, and you should be. Right, you should always be <laughs> suspicious. Right, right. Yeah. You can never be too paranoid, Dave. No. <laughs> That's exactly what you want me to think, Joe. Oh, no. I want you to think for yourself, Dave. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, interesting information. Uh, we'll have a link to this, uh, the report over from HelpNet Security. All right, Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from a listener named Vaughn who writes, Hi, CyberWire. Sharing a snail mail fraud scheme. This was a first for us that I know of. It arrived via a USPS envelope. The recipient didn't have an existing contract for this company, so they went online to verify and found the very prominently displayed phone number and a W-9 form on their website. As an exchange admin, I have the tools for reporting, notifying, and purging phishing emails, but no way of knowing who got this. So mm. this is actually a letter that he got or somebody at his company got. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's not not comical, you know, like normally we, we, we do these that are very funny. Right. But this one is is interesting. Yeah. If yeah. you open up the letter, it, it has a letterhead that says it comes from the North Atlantic Supply Company, which which may very well be a legitimate company. Yeah. Uh, and it has a nice, like, factory logo with a little chemical vial over top of it. It's just, uh, just the kind of logo design you would expect from a company with a creative name like North Atlantic Supply Company. Correct. <laughs> and it is a bill for almost $600, and they're saying it's for concentrated cleaner and degreaser. Plus right. a shipping charge. Oh, and they gave you $50 off, too. Oh, that's nice right. of them. There is an age-old way to prevent this. Uh, it is called the purchase order number. Yeah. Right? Most companies have a an internal system that says, if you just send us a bill, it better have a purchase order number on it, or we're never going to pay it. Right. Because that's how we reference our internal service. Because this stuff has been happening for a very long time. Yeah. And companies don't want to be defrauded of money, so they have found a way around or, or found a way to protect themselves on this. There is right. no purchase order number on this invoice. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that strikes me about this is that, you know, concentrated cleaner and degreaser is, that could be something that is industrial. Right. That could be just cleaning supplies, you know, yep. for your janitorial staff. So it, it's very generic. It's right. very beige. Yes. But then if you go to the website where they say, our phone number has been updated, and they have a phone number there. Uh, first of all, we don't know is if this is a, a legitimate company whose website has either expired or been taken over by someone, or or the whole thing could just be made up from nothing. Right, <laughs> right. Yep. But there's a phone number here, and, and I'm sure if you call this phone number, 
you're going to get somebody who's going to do their best to convince you that it's a real thing. Yeah, I would bet that's the case. Yeah. What do you do here? I guess you go online and you see if there is a real North Atlantic supply company. But in this case, if you did that, you're going to go to this. It's going to take you to this website with the phone number, which is probably a fake phone number. I guess the, the bottom line here is just you need to be vigilant. Right. You know, you can't just pay an invoice just because it comes in. And yeah, it's probably it's probably the guys down on the shop floor or it's probably the cleaning crew or who knows what. You need some kind of verification. And if, if you don't have a purchase order number, if something doesn't add up, then slow down. Right. <laughs> Try That's to find out. Thing. Slow down. Follow right. the process. Yeah. Did somebody actually order that? Because it might just be an honest mistake. Right. You know, this, they, this may be a legit company who accidentally sent an invoice to the wrong people or who knows what. But you don't want to be out 600 bucks just nope. because it's easier and faster to just fill out the forms and send off the check. That's right? right. All right. Well, thanks to our listener for sending that in. That is an interesting one. We would love to hear from you, of course. You can send us your catch of the day to hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Kev Breen. He is from Immersive Labs. And our conversation focused on this whole notion of whaling attacks. Uh, Here's my conversation with Kev Breen. When we talk about whaling, we're talking about significantly more targeted attacks than standard fishing or even more targeted than spear fishing. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out like how susceptible like chief executives, like anybody who's a signatory uh, on financials. So these are kind of their targets. And they usually start off with something innocuous, like, can I even get an email reaching to them? So we'll see things like blank emails coming through. So emailing the CEO at an email address. So maybe it's first name dot last name at company. Uh, maybe it's first initial dot last name. So we'll see blank emails coming through. So no subject lines, like no body. So nothing really suspicious that's going to set off any kind of alerts if you've got any kind of protective monitoring. And that's literally just there to see if those email addresses are alive, if they're receiving email. So the attackers will be looking for any bounce backs, any failed deliveries. And then once they've got that list of uh, information, they'll know whether they're successful um, at sending those emails through. And that's probably a a common first stage uh, for somebody who's looking to perform a whaling attack. And so where does it go from there? From there, again, it depends on the attacker's motivations. So typically, this is financially uh, incentives, but it can also be looking for IP or looking for other kind of information. So depending on what the attacker's aims are, uh, they'll go down one of a few routes. So with more traditional whaling attacks where they're looking to convince uh, to get payment information or to convince payments, they'll usually start just by sending some high pressure emails. So at this point, they'll have done a lot of research, so they might know who the CEO's PA is. So they might construct an email that looks to be coming from the PA uh, with the correct signatures, uh, email footers, that kind of stuff. And it will just be something uh, like, uh, we've had an invoice come through and we need your signature on this. Uh, And there'll be a couple of elements to it. So one will be a sense of urgency. Uh, So uh, there'll be a time element trying to put pressure on. So they know they have a very short window with which to try and uh, trick somebody. And then one of the other actions will be uh, something like a call to action. So we've got this invoice that's come in. We need you to go and sign this invoice immediately, or we need you to transfer funds over to this or approve this quickly. Uh, and we're going to, if we, we're going to lose the contract if you don't. So there's going to be like a, a definitive call to action. There'll be a sense of pressure. Uh, and then they may even tie in something uh, like an excuse for why they're not doing this in person. Obviously, we're in a COVID environment at the moment, so it's very easy to justify why you're not doing this in person. Uh, but traditional things will be something like, uh, I've just come back from lunch and this is I've seen this, so can you do it quickly? So there's a reason why they haven't come and seen you in person, just to try and add a sense of legitimacy to it. And so how do you counteract this sort of thing? How do you, how do you uh, prepare your folks to be able to thwart these attempts? This is one of the most difficult things. So more traditional phishing attacks, uh, they use traditional lures. So invoice fraud or things like that, they're 
kind of easy to spot. Typically speaking, with whaling attacks, they're a lot more targeted. So the attackers have done research, whether that's looking through LinkedIn, uh, looking through uh, documents that you might have public. So they they construct something very personal to you uh, or to the the executive that they're targeting. So it's a lot harder for more traditional techniques to miss these. So one of the best defenses uh, you can do is going through exercising and making sure your execs understand things like if you see something, just pause, like take a second. Uh, nothing should be that urgent that you've only got seconds to respond. If in doubt, then you want to contact the person, not by replying, but by going directly to them. Uh, so exercising those kind of techniques and those kind of behaviors will reinforce uh, some of that learning. So you'll understand what's going to happen if you ever arrive in that situation. And the second part will be to almost assume that at some point it's going to happen to you. So assume that you get a CEO on a very stressful day, gets this email come through. It's very convincing. It's very targeted. And in a moment, they do whatever the emails asked them to do or whatever the phone call has asked them to do. Uh, so it's important to understand how you respond to that those first minutes uh, and hours of that kind of cyber incident or that uh, incident are going to be the most important uh, if you're going to try and potentially recover any funds before it's gone too far. So exercising not just how you identify these things, but how you respond to them in those first moments is a key piece uh, to protecting yourselves. When you do tabletop exercises on these sorts of things, do you often witness, you know, people's attitudes changing as they go through the exercise? I guess I'm I'm wondering, do people come in with a, a high level of confidence that I would never fall victim to this sort of thing? But then over time, they realize, that, you know, this could happen to anybody. Absolutely. It, it's very easy to sit on the outside and go, like, why would anybody ever fall for that? Like, And then as we go through the, the tabletop exercises, as you show them examples, as you put them in those situations where you've got to make snap decisions uh, and you show them like the real world examples, uh, you see like that light switch moment where it dawns and there's actually that's quite convincing. Uh, so it does happen a lot that like when you actually sit down go through these tabletop exercises, do you see the impact, you see those kind of things. It does dawn on people how actually easy it would be, which we see in the, the media as we see these things reported all the time where companies are being hit by this kind of attack. Are there any technical things that, that organizations can put in place to try to, to help with this? Absolutely. And not necessarily technical like cyber protecting from the emails coming in. Uh, there's mm. definitely things you can do there, but uh, more in your process and your procedural techniques. So if you are having somebody setting up uh, wire transfers, then make sure that you've got some kind of confirmation route on there. So some kind of known process where if something comes in as a priority payment that's got to be made, you understand where that goes through. So you have a process, you track it. It's not just somebody uh, entering credit card details into a into a website. So having those processes in place. And all we're looking for is we're just trying to insert a little bit of a delay so that you can stop, think, and check. So before you just rush to, to action, because that's what a lot of these emails do is they they pressure you into fast responses before you have a chance to think, actually, why would I be sending this payment now? We've only spoke to them twice or, or things of that nature. So definitely technical things that you can do on, on your email side, maybe looking for blank emails as those first uh, checks are coming through. Uh, but mm -hmm. definitely some on the, if you're using uh, software, uh, maybe something like Salesforce to do all your stuff, like having the correct configuration there is going to help you a lot as well. I suppose even making people aware that when if they sense that that they're being put in that emotional state of having to act quickly that that itself is a red flag absolutely and one of the things that organizations can do is to run something like a, a central spam box so it's an email address in your organization so spam at company name and you get your users to uh, to send emails they think are suspicious there so it's all very good to run the standard phishing training, like have people clicked on the link. But what I'm more interested in is how often do people actually report something that looks potentially suspicious? And if you can ingrain that into all of your staff, where if you see something suspicious, just send it to us. Somebody will look at it. Uh, they might not respond to you immediately, but somebody's going to look at it. 
And you get people comfortable in the reporting uh, so that they'll start to stop and think more about these emails that come in. So they, if they're used to sending something to a spam box, they'll see their email and go, actually, yeah, that does look a bit suspicious. Let me just fire it off to the security team uh, before I action it even further. More traditional tabletops, like you get people in a room, you get the round your PowerPoint presentation. They're not the best, um, especially in the world we find ourselves in. So being able to run uh, something asynchronously distributed uh, is important. So uh, if you exercising is absolutely the right thing to do. If the only option you have is a tabletop exercise, then great. Uh, but like asynchronous, pulling in all of the members. So not just your security teams, your security teams, your PAs, your executives, your finance team. You want a really broad reach so every member of your organization understands what the correct reporting chains are and how to respond should you have an incident. All right, Joe, what do you think? You know, Dave, I love all the terms we have in cybersecurity, yeah, in the tech industry. You know, we started with phishing, mm-hmm. and then it got really focused, and people called it spear phishing. Right. And then they started going after bigger targets, and people started calling that whaling. Right. <laughs> Very nautical. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> right. But whaling is essentially just spear phishing bigger targets, right? hmm And I like hearing the process that Kev talks about here. They start with just a bunch of blank emails right? Just to see if they can fingerprint the organization. This is the reconnaissance phase of every attack. This is the first thing that has to happen is they have to go out and they have to find all of the open ports. Or if, in the case of a phishing attack or a spear phishing or whaling attack, they're going to actually try to find email addresses. And the way they do that is by probing. Right. Uh, the next thing they do is they, they send a high pressure message. It's a typical social engineering attack, right? It, it is in and of itself uh, a social engineering attack. There's an artificial time constraint, a sense of urgency, mm-hmm. and they're going to be uh, spoofing their assistant, mm-hmm. their administrative assistant or their personal assistant, as they say in the UK. Here's something that's that's very important to understand about these attacks. The more targeted they are, the harder they are to identify and resist. Hmm. We've seen this in business email compromise attacks. We've seen this in sophisticated, even phone attacks, where People have gotten so good at impersonating other people, impersonating the victims. They've done their homework and they understand how the victims work and what their process is. And they are really good at exploiting it and finding the triggers for these people. Right, right. And it's worth it for them to do that work. It's worth it because when you're going after somebody who can sign a check for $50,000 or $500,000, that's a pretty big incentive. Yeah. And we've seen these attacks where they've cost companies and organizations millions of dollars Mm -hmm. in fraudulent payments. Yeah. Training and exercise is, I think, the only way to prevent this. I mean, from a personal standpoint, there are all kinds of technical things you can you can put on to protect the people from ever getting it. But some of these messages are going to get through those technical barriers, especially once they started probing your email account, mm-hmm. right? Or your, your email domain. Cause they are not going to send you the actual phishing email or the whaling email from the same address they use to probe. Mm. So even if you block the probing address, that first kinetic email that's coming in is going to be from a new address. Mm. You're going to have never seen it before and it's going to look completely legit and will mm-hmm. probably just, it will be handcrafted. It will be handwritten. It won't be some massive emailing so you can identify, hey, look at all these emails we're getting with the exact same content. This is obviously either spam or a phishing attempt. This is going to be one email that comes in, mm-hmm. like a harpoon, right, <laughs> to get the whale. Right. And it's going to be very difficult to, to identify as a scam email. Yeah. I do like what Kev says about making the technical solution, designing your process and procedure to introduce delays and to give you time to stop and think about it. I also like introducing delays based on communication. In other words, I've gotten this email that demands that I pay some invoice. I have to make a phone call to the person who sent me this email and validate it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we, we've talked about how it's common for organizations if you have a, above a certain dollar amount that there has to be two signatures on a check. Right. Perhaps a, a similar thing could be that if it's above a certain dollar amount, a phone call has to go to the the person who sent the invoice just as verification. Right. And you don't want to slow down your your accounts payable people. You don't want to, you know, you, I guess you, it has to be a balance. Yes, you know? it does have to be a balance. Again, yeah. we're talking about managing your risk level. Right. But everybody needs to be a part of the, the security side of things. Correct. Yeah. All right. Well, again, our thanks to Kev Breen for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. 
That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.